Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. They grow very slowly, so those big fish, they're very precious. We're trying to collect as much information as we can to ensure that the resource is available today, tomorrow, and 100 years from now. Without the tracking collars, we wouldn't know as much about what was going on, <laughs> especially about individual animals. This is kind of the last stage of a project where, you know, we're actually actively out here doing something. We're trying to get some more plants out here to get them established. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Doing what's right and good, regardless of the degree of difficulty, takes guts. Those are the people who build Ram Trucks. Ram. They look prehistoric. They're awesome looking fish. Lots of teeth. They're something that would be dreamt up as a monster in a Hollywood movie, but the truth is they're just not such monsters. They get a bad rap a lot. Have a good life. It's late spring on the Trinity River between Dallas and Houston. That's basically it. Fishing guide Dawson Hefner is on the hunt for alligator gar. We're looking to get something over six foot here today. But catching a gargantuan gar first requires catching some smaller fish. That's a haul. That's the easy part. Are you keeping these? Yeah. With bait on board, the gar anglers head down river to try their luck. Y'all ready? As far as uh, rod and reel angling for alligator gar, most people give you a strange look when you tell them that's what you do. Uh, they just look at you dumbfounded like, uh, really? Along with Dawson on this gar quest is his friend Jason. I've always felt like a, a game fish is what people tell you you should catch, but a sport fish is what you want to catch. So I definitely consider a sport fish. Jason once landed a gar here that was bigger than him. My personal best is six feet, seven inches. I like catching all different species, and the bigger, the better. Jason's friend John is also an experienced angler, but he has never fished for alligator gar. They get to such huge size in, in the freshwater environment of Texas. I think most people don't realize how large they get and really what an exciting adventure would be to, to catch one. In Texas waters, the long nose, short nose, and spotted gar can all be found. But the alligator gar grows the largest of all, with catches weighing as much as 300 pounds. Eight feet is not uncommon. Hopefully a hungry fish will come through here and find it. Though trophy-sized gar can be caught around the state, the Trinity River is known as one of the best alligator gar fisheries in the world. Though you might not guess that today. We're having a pretty slow day here so far. We've been set up on this spot for about an hour and a half, haven't had any runs. It's looking like we may need to move and see if we can find some more active fish somewhere else. People don't travel the Trinity River. I don't think it's publicized or promoted at all, but there's a lot of natural beauty here, tranquility, and uh, just the absence of people. I'm a people person, but uh, not when it comes to fishing. <laughs> the fewer people, the, the, the more plentiful the fish, I think. The crew finds another promising sandbar on a bend in the river and serves up a variety of cut bait. Rod alarms will signal a bite, so there's only one thing to do. There is a lot of waiting involved. But they haven't waited for long when there's some action on the furthest rod. Something is taking this one. 
Some days there's actually enough activity that you don't get to relax because you get to run back and forth to rods most of the day. He let go. That'll keep us going for several more hours for sure. We're getting closer. <laughs> As catching gar has become the focus of more anglers, studying them has become a focus of fisheries biologists. Historically, no one really cared about them. No one really right. fished for them. Yep. So the managers didn't really spend time collecting data on them either. That meant little was known about the lives of alligator gar. But biologist Dan Dougherty and Chris Bodine are changing that through studies like this one on Choke Canyon Reservoir. Anglers have gotten much more interested in, in fishing for alligator gar, hook and line, as well as boat fishermen. The increase in popularity, obviously, is putting greater pressure on our populations. We've got a fish on already. Hopefully it's a gar. Texas is home to the best populations of alligator gar left in the United States, and we want to keep them that way. The only way to do that is to collect data one gar at a time. We get fish in the boat, and uh, uh, you always want to be a little bit careful around the head because it is full of teeth. But the cool thing about it is that they're overall a pretty docile creature. They just simply want to get back into the water. So we tag the fish with two different tag types, an internal tag called a pit tag. And we also tag them with an external tag. If an angler catches that fish, he can call the number that's on the tag and report that catch to us. 451. That's very important information for an idea of harvest rates. 1439. Length and maximum girth. We also take a genetic sample. 585. Once a fish is released, rinse and repeat. Oh, they are full of slime. Nets are reset, scanned for fish, Big splash. and retrieved. It's Buffalo Central today. Freshwater drum. Unfortunately, they catch anything big that swims by. Not quite the right kind, but we are catching fish. By the end of the day, Dan and Chris have caught only four alligator gar. Definitely don't want that dude in our gill net. But they do feel lucky to have not caught an alligator or the other toothy creature they spy on the lake as they pull in their nets. What is that? Is that a rattlesnake? Dude, it is a rattlesnake. Look at him stick his head up like that. I've never seen one. Rattlesnakes in the water. Now I can say I've seen it all. That's gotta be an alligator gar. The next day of research has a slow start. Negative. Only one gar by mid-afternoon. But after hours of looking, they find the fish. They're surfacing like crazy, so. Oh, that was a big splash. This is gonna be exciting. Moments after being set, two nets are full of gar. Little guy. Easy, easy. Watch your legs. Soon, the boat is jumping. Okay. Lord have mercy. It's kind of like the angler coming out to fish. Some days the crappie bite, some days they don't. They must work fast for all the fish to survive. It's amazing. It's amazing. Done? Yes, sir. Come on, buddy. Play nice. 14 fish in five minutes. That's gar fishing at its finest there. It's a big contribution to the research. Bye, baby. And it's a sure sign that catching big gar has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. Back on the Trinity River, timing has not been right for John, Jason, and Dawson. Bad gummit. In spite of getting some bites and fishing all night, they have not landed a gar. By morning, they have other problems. We've got thunderstorms on the way in and it's already started to rain, so unfortunately, we won't be able to fish any more today. But determination has them back on the water in three weeks. The weather is clear, and this time, Dawson has some added support. My wife's along today for good luck. See if that won't help straighten things out. It seems to help. Within minutes of the first cast, there's a fish on the line. Real, 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 real. Strength, this massive strength. It's a challenge, and I, I enjoy a challenge. Ah, he's a fighter. Woo! -hoo! It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Adrenaline rush you get, it's totally worth it. Oh, this is great. Not a bad fish to start the day. My first one, <laughs> outstanding. All right. 
bang this get back up the bank. <laughs> These are good. Four, four and a half feet long would be my guess. I certainly want a photo of that one. Be good, fish. <laughs> we haven't seen a giant gator guard today, but uh, you know, they're still fun to catch. All right, away he goes. While this fish story comes to an end, to the story of alligator gar angling may be just beginning. It does seem like they become more popular each year. A face only a mother could love. <laughs> With anglers and biologists taking care to protect these fish, gargantuan gar should always have a home in Texas waters. Had a great time. People travel from all over the world to fish for these fish, and uh, there's not a lot of other experiences like it. We're at the uh, Gap Restoration Project, and what we're looking at is an area that used to be marsh, and the marsh grass that used to be here got converted to open water. My name is Sherry O'Brien. I work in the Dickinson Regional Office in Dickinson, Texas. I'm a coastal ecologist. My primary duties with the department right now is doing wetland restoration. The Galveston Bay Area has lost, you know, over 35,000 acres uh, between 1950 and the 1990s, but we've restored a whole lot, and Sherry's been an instrumental part of that. Um, what you're seeing back behind me is the actual creating of a marsh mound. You know, when you look at this material, it's coming up and it looks dark, it looks black, but what's going to be left is just real nice sand uh, that we'll come back and plant. We're going to be planting the mounds in this area right here. She doesn't just do on the ground work, but she's also involved in working with partners and bringing those people together to make uh, projects happen. Right now we're at the NRG Eco Center. This is the facility that provides the, all of our plants for our restoration projects. She's passionate about the estuary and she makes everybody kind of raise their game when they're uh, around her. You work a little bit harder and a little bit longer. No, I'm not the only one that does this sort of work. I mean, we have a kind of a community. Now, I might be the project manager for a project, but I still get lots of help from a lot of people. I work with Texas General Land Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, Galveston Bay Foundation, Galveston Bay Estuary Program, Audubon, Ducks Unlimited, NRG, CCA, NRCS, Corps of Engineers. These are my partners. It's great to have somebody like Sherry that looks for these kind of projects, goes out and goes after them, because it's not just great for the environment, but it's great for us that brings in more people to the park. So this is kind of the last stage of a project where, you know, we're actually actively out here doing something. We're trying to get some more plants out here to get them established. These projects don't come easy. Habitat conservation does not come easy. I'm doing something good. That's what keeps me doing it, I guess. I'm Bonnie McKinney, and I live on the Black Gap Wildlife Management Area, which is down along the Mexican border. Mama Bear has moved. Maybe make a complete circle around, but maybe she's right back in there. It's very faint. We have a research project going on here on the Black Gap Wildlife Management Area. We have seven bears collared. Got her. Yeah, he's right there. Yeah. You can just swing back around there again. A natural recovery by any wildlife species very seldom does it naturally recover without man helping it along. And the bears have just literally decided to make West Texas their home again and are actually moving back into this country from northern Mexico. So it's up to us to kind of help them in any way that we can and we need to learn something about these bears. Look over there, what's that on, wait, what's that on the ridge? Stop, stop, look. I think it's on top because... Yeah, she's right on the top. It's where huh? she's at. She's right on the you top. No, but I can hear her. You can put the antenna right We're there. studying home hear. range, diet, habitats, uh, mortalities, and we also want to be able to provide management techniques for private landowners uh, that are now finding themselves living with the black bear in West Texas. 
some of our colleagues and peers, they sort of look at you and say, you don't really have black bears on Black Gap, do you? Well, yeah, we've got seven bears collared. Oh, come on, you know, what do they eat? Well, they eat Spanish dacker and soto and yucca, and they sort of shake their head and say, it's just amazing, we can't believe that. Well, come down, visit the study site, and we'll take you out. <laughs> Bonnie does a lot of different things. She does a lot of cactus surveys and bird work. Uh, right now, a lot of stuff is taking Bonnie's time up is this bear research program that's going on in the Black Gap Wildlife Area right now. Well, I'm the boss, but uh, he bosses. And, and sometimes there's little deals, you know, like you go do this, and they say, well, I don't work for you. And <laughs> we get along. You know how marriage is. Well, we've lived on the Gap uh, almost 20 years. And uh, it's kind of a joke, when we moved to the Gap, uh, he said, oh, you'll love over there. There's lots of trees, lots of water. Well, you couldn't get more desert than Black Gap. So actually, we met on the Black Gap. You can look around here, and there's not a lot of women in this country, so you, <laughs> you make opportunities where you can. I guess you could say charmed me. I actually caught her stealing cactus, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, life sentence. I try to make the best of it here, so. It's not always peaches and cream. That's for sure. Uh, he really didn't charm me, guys. Bonnie's a strong-willed person. I'm set in my ways, and... Uh, <laughs> it's really been a life sentence. <laughs> we love the solitude out here. Um, if we get in an argument, we can certainly scream our heads off and not worry about the neighbors hearing about us, but... Uh... It's actually about 85 miles to an area where you can get a good selection of groceries and things. And... Uh, that's an hour and a half drive one way, and that's an extra $20 added on to your uh, food bill. We also disagree on a lot of things, but uh, being a husband and wife, we work it out. Yeah, it can be crazy and different working with your wife, but it's, it's really a good job. Bye. Bears move around till about 11 o'clock when it gets real hot, so uh, we go check traps early in the morning. Okay, this is a f uh, fun part of bear trapping, resetting the barrels. The guys have refused to crawl in here on their tummies and rebate for me. Okay, I'm gonna use a commercial bait. It's a strawberry flavored bait. Ouch. Bear comes in here, you can't resist it. They love sweet stuff. He'll flip this little trigger and he tries to get this bait bag, and we catch a bear. You see a bear out here in this country, and they've been gone so long, and then to have them back, uh, it's a pretty incredible deal. And it's also uh, putting back a part of Texas that was gone, that we thought was gone forever. Uh, they're back. Come on out. Bring those drugs as quick as you can. I'm in route. We got a bear in a tree up in Alpine. I need that stuff. 10-4, uh, we're on our way. We just got a call from Alpine that there's a bear in a tree at Alpine, and uh, I've got the drug kit with me. Bill is uh, in route, and uh, Don's gone up to pick up the covert trap. So we are on the way. should stay up the tree, hopefully. And we'll dart her, and then probably get her down with ropes. Good God, how could you miss it? Get out of the way. Get back, please. You gotta mix it. I got it mixed right here. Oh, okay. Hold this right here. How big is that bear? He's right he's there. He's an adult bear. Okay. You wanna, if he falls, you wanna put him in tarp? I got a big tarp. And I was out fooling around in the yard, and I looked up in this tree, and uh, there was a bear in the tree. So I'll go in and tell my wife, and, um, she didn't believe me, of course. She had to come out and look. Good 
Good shot. Well, he'll go down a minute. He's in a perfect tree because when he falls, he'll just hit those branches and it'll break his fall all the way down. Okay, y'all get, get back a little bit. We're going to drop him down. <laughs> We're going to attempt to drop him down. Are you ready? Hang on. That's a big bear. Oh. Take that magnet off. This is cool. Talk about you got to touch him? No, y'all need to stay back. Bears are all wild animals. They're not. Okay, I need tip of his nose. Right on the tip. Right down the middle center of his back. We need more tape. <laughs> Greg, we need to get that blood. Ear tagging. Okay. We put the tracking collars on these bear because we want to determine their home ranges and compare it to other studies in the United States. Uh, I expect us to find some pretty exciting information out. And uh, without the tracking collars, we wouldn't know as much about what was going on, <laughs> especially about individual animals. Collars plenty loose. He's snoring. He have a wet towel. Daddy snores. He does. He goes, oh, oh, oh. What do you guys think we should call this bear, huh? Let's Big bear. Really neat Black, Black bear. No, come Big on. Bear. Papa bear. Come Big bear. On. Blue. You have to get him something to wake him up or what? No, this drug is a, is a drug that's uh, really good for bears. He'll wake up, he'll be really groggy and... He's not really a problem bear. Uh, really didn't do any damage or tear anything up. It's just that uh, we, we really moved him for his protection, not for people's protection. He wasn't a problem bear or a nuisance bear. So there's no problem with him going anywhere as far as, I mean, he's not a, not a problem. But we'll monitor his movement. A lot of times a relocated bear doesn't stay in the area that you put him in. So we'll get out and do lots of ground telemetry in the next couple of days with this big guy. OK, what we got here is a rope tied to our guillotine gate so we can let this bear loose without anybody being around it for safety reasons and also because he might come out a little better if he's not anybody standing around to open the gate. Well, all we gotta do is turn him loose now. I wonder if he'll stay in here. We'll be up here. I'll come up early in the morning and run telemetry on him, see what he's doing. He'll probably sleep off pretty much the rest of the afternoon. It's almost a comforting feeling to know that black bears are out here in this country and they're, they're moving around at night, they're feeding, they're raising their young uh, after being gone for so long, that they're actually coming back. It kind of soothes my soul, if you will say, that this animal has come back. Basically, he's done it on his own. Hopefully, we can give him some help to go ahead and finish his expansion into historic range. But to me, I th it just, it just uh, is a good feeling. I really think that a lot of people are going to get that same feeling, that, that we have this animal here, and that maybe we're doing something right on Wildlife Managed Mary to have this animal here.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Doing what's right and good, regardless of the degree of difficulty, takes guts. Those are the people who build Ram Trucks. Ram.